The following presentation is on fluid overload and treatment with the Aquadex SmartFlow system. It is intended for clinicians, either prescribers or providers of Aquadex therapy. By the end of this training presentation, you should be able to understand the causes and impact of hypervolemia or fluid overload, understand the limitations of current therapies, describe how Aquadex smart flow therapy can achieve treatment goals, understand patient selection, venous access, anticoagulation, and UF and blood flow rate considerations, and perform Aquadex smart flow system setup and troubleshooting. There are several potential causes of hypervolemia or fluid overload. Some of them are listed here, most notably congestive heart failure, but it may also occur during or after cardiac surgeries such as coronary artery bypass grafting, nephrotic syndrome, kidney damage, liver damage, myocardial infarction, sepsis, and severe burn. Signs and symptoms of fluid overload include the following. Jugular venous distension greater than 8 centimeters, peripheral or sacral edema greater than or equal to 2 plus, pulmonary rals, pulmonary edema or pleural effusions on a chest x-ray, PND or orthopnea, respiratory rate greater than or equal to 20 per minute, or LVEDP or wedge pressure greater than 20. In this section, we'll cover fluid overload in a heart failure patient population. Heart failure is the leading cause of hospitalizations among adults over 65 in the U.S. It accounts for over a million hospitalizations each year, and 90% of those hospitalizations are due to the signs and symptoms of fluid overload. The average length of stay is roughly five days, and readmissions are closely watched, with 24% of heart failure patients being readmitted within 30 days and 50% readmitted within six months. Hospitals can be penalized if this rate of readmission is higher than expected, and that penalty can account for a loss of up to 3% of all Medicare reimbursements. Diuretics play a central role in the management of fluid overload in heart failure patients. However, diuretics are associated with mixed outcomes and adverse clinical events. For example, the longer a patient is on diuretics, the less effective they become. There's a high incidence of poor diuretic response, with one study showing 40% having a poor response and 68% having a suboptimal response. There's also the high risk of rehospitalization that we earlier discussed. Some of the adverse clinical events include worsening renal function or accelerated kidney function decline, electrolyte imbalances and symptomatic hypotension, plus a higher risk of mortality. Diuretics have been studied for decades in clinical studies and registries. The ADHERE registry, which looked at over 50,000 heart failure hospitalizations, showed that nearly 50% of patients were discharged with residual fluid, and 16% of patients were discharged with weight gain. In the DOSE trial, which looked at optimizing diuretic strategies, Regardless of strategy, 42% of the heart failure patients in the study reached the composite endpoint of death, rehospitalization, or ER visit at 60 days. Ultrafiltration in heart failure patients has a number of proven benefits. These include no significant change to electrolytes, reduced neurohormonal stimulation, or RAS, stabilization or improvement of cardiac hemodynamics, restored diuretic effectiveness in patients allowing for improved response to diuretic agents, 53% reduction in the risk of rehospitalization for heart failure when compared with diuretics, and early initiation of ultrafiltration in acute decompensated heart failure patients has been shown to reestablish euvolemia and may decrease hospital length of stay. Loop diuretics, which eliminate hypotonic urine, have been compared with ultrafiltration, which removes isotonic plasma water, in several clinical studies. These show that diuretics are unpredictable in the elimination of sodium and water, whereas ultrafiltration is predictable. 
With loop diuretics, you may have development of resistance, whereas ultrafiltration can restore diuretic responsiveness. Diuretics carry a risk of hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, whereas there's no change in electrolytes with ultrafiltration, particularly potassium and magnesium. Diuretics show insufficient symptom relief with persistent congestion and failure to lower of sodium levels, whereas ultrafiltration has more effective decongestion and fewer heart failure events compared to loop diuretics. With diuretics, you see worsening heart failure, increased mortality after discharge, and an increase in rehospitalization rates. Ultrafiltration shows improved GFR, efficacy, and improved outcomes. In this section, we'll discuss fluid overload in CV surgery and critical care patients. Nearly one of five patients who undergo cardiac operations require readmission. A multi-center study that looks at the causes for readmission shows that volume overload was the third most prevalent cause within 30 days and the most prevalent cause for readmission beyond 30 days. Major postoperative complications, including fluid overload, are associated with significantly worse survival and longer length of stay. The graph on the right shows fluid accumulation on the y-axis and length of ICU stay on the x-axis. Fluid overload has a significant association with the combined events of death, infection, bleeding, arrhythmia, and pulmonary edema, and the early identification of fluid overload is essential to establish adequate management in cardiac patients. Ultrafiltration in cardiac surgery patients has been well established with traditional devices, and there have been many studies that have showed the following benefits. Modified ultrafiltration reduces the duration of assisted ventilation post-op. Combined conventional and modified ultrafiltration is safe and effective in adult cardiac surgery patients. Ultrafiltration improves cardiac performance, and ultrafiltration following cardiac surgery may reduce the need for blood transfusions. Understanding the patient's status from a hemodynamic standpoint can help with both establishing whether the patient could benefit from ultrafiltration and also guiding ultrafiltration therapy. The table here shows the normal ranges for various hemodynamic parameters. As an example, an elevated central venous pressure could indicate that the patient has fluid overload. Prior to initiating ultrafiltration therapy, prescribers should consider the following. Define the fluid removal rate. The ultrafiltration rate, or UF rate, can be set anywhere from 0 to 500 milliliters per hour. In volume-sensitive conditions such as right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, hepatic disease, or cardiogenic shock, consider a lower UF rate. The UF rate should not exceed the plasma refill rate, or in other words, the rate at which fluid moves from the interstitial space into the intravascular space. The recommended blood flow rate is 40 milliliters per minute. Define the quantity of fluid to be removed or your fluid removal goal and establish fluid restrictions as required. These are some considerations for initiating ultrafiltration therapy. Set the UF rate as per the physician order, but it may be adjusted as needed throughout therapy to meet the NED fluid balance for that patient. Adjust the blood flow rate as needed. Blood flow rates below 20 milliliters per minute are not recommended. Monitor the patient's vital signs and hemodynamics, and in the case of hemodynamic instability, notify the physician. Ultrafiltration may need to be stopped by setting the UF rate to zero until the patient becomes hemodynamically stable. Ultrafiltration should only be continued after the patient has been stabilized. Here are some considerations for the discontinuation of therapy. Confirm that the desired fluid removal is achieved for the patient per the physician's assessment. Press the stop key to stop the blood pump. Disconnect the withdrawal circuit connector from the withdrawal catheter lumen. If blood return is desired, attach the withdrawal circuit connector to a normal bag of saline and press and hold the manual key to return the blood to the patient while filling the circuit with saline. 
Please note that there are only 35 milliliters in the circuit at any given time, and thus blood return is not required. The Aquadex SmartFlow system is equipped with technology to monitor both hematocrit and SVO2. These are both optional settings. Hematocrit monitoring is a method to assess changes in blood volume in real time. It may help determine how close a patient is to completion of UF therapy. It can be set to automatically turn off the UF pump if the hematocrit exceeds a user-defined limit, or it can be set to simply monitor hematocrit. The system can be set to 15-minute averaging, which is best for ambulating patients, or 1-minute averaging, which is best for non-ambulating patients. The values of hematocrit are graphed and visible on the console, along with SVO2 values. SVO2 monitoring may present an alternative to cardiac output monitoring. SVO2 is the percentage of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in the blood returning to the right side of the heart. So it reflects the amount of oxygen left over after the tissues remove what they need. Both in surgical and septic patients, pulmonary edema may prolong the duration of mechanical ventilation. Assuming hematocrit and SVO2 levels remain within a target range set by the prescriber, it's a means to ensure that ultrafiltration does not induce a significant change in blood volume and cardiac output. Dr. Frederick Michard, a previously practicing intensivist, wrote a white paper entitled Optimizing the Delivery of Ultrafiltration in Critically Ill Patients. In it, he discusses the use of hematocrit monitoring in conjunction with SVO2 monitoring to guide ultrafiltration therapy in critically ill patients, particularly when other hemodynamic parameters such as cardiac output are not available. In this white paper, he presents a flowchart that uses hematocrit and SVO2 to determine the set UF rate and how to adjust it throughout therapy. Presented here are some of the highlights of Dr. Michard's white paper. Extracorporeal UF has been proposed to treat fluid overload in patients who do not respond to diuretic therapy. It may induce a decrease in plasma volume that can be detected by a rise in hematocrit. A limited number of patients undergoing UF are equipped with a cardiac output monitor. An alternative to cardiac output monitoring is venous oxygen saturation or SVO2 monitoring. In hemodynamically stable patients, it may be useful to define target ranges both for hematocrit and SVO2 on the basis of values recorded at the beginning of the UF session. As a result of aggressive fluid resuscitation and increased capillary permeability, fluid overload and tissue edema are also frequently observed in high-risk surgical patients, as well as during sepsis and septic shock. Both in surgical and septic patients, pulmonary edema may prolong the duration of mechanical ventilation and increase the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury and ventilator-associated pneumonia. If hematocrit and SVO2 remain within the target range, this is a means to ensure that UF does not induce a significant change in blood volume and cardiac output. Here you can see a flow chart from the white paper that defines how to use hematocrit and SVO2 to guide ultrafiltration therapy. If you have a patient with fluid overload requiring ultrafiltration and who has hemodynamic stability, you can use this flow chart. Record the hematocrit and SVO2 baseline values. Then define a target range, as an example 10% from baseline that you're willing to accept during ultrafiltration therapy. Start ultrafiltration at 100 milliliters per hour. Monitor hematocrit and SVO2 throughout therapy. Now we'll discuss the various outputs from the flowchart. If hematocrit and SVO2 are both within range, you may consider increasing the UF rate, as prescribed by a physician. When hematocrit increases, but SVO2 is still within range, consider decreasing ultrafiltration, but continue therapy. If hematocrit increases and SVO2 decreases, you should stop ultrafiltration therapy, and that can be done by setting the UF rate to zero. In other words, standby mode. If SVO2 returns to within range, you may return to the starting point of the flowchart, setting the UF rate to 100 milliliters per hour. If hematocrit is within range but SVO2 decreases, 
consider whether there may be other factors impacting SVO2. Look at the patient's SAO2 and consider whether there may be agitation, fever, or hemorrhage present. We'll now discuss the specifics of the Aquadex Smart Flow system. The Aquadex Smart Flow system is indicated for continuous ultrafiltration therapy for temporary or extended use in adult and pediatric patients weighing 20 kilograms or more whose fluid overload is unresponsive to medical management, including diuretics. Temporary means up to eight hours, or extended means longer than eight hours in patients who require hospitalization. All treatments must be administered by a healthcare provider within an outpatient or inpatient clinical setting under physician prescription, both of whom having received training in extracorporeal therapies. Aquadex Smart Flow Therapy is simple, flexible, and smart. It includes easy setup and monitoring that allows for up to a 4 to 1 patient to nurse ratio. It's highly automated with only one setting required to begin therapy. It includes smart alarms and alerts that prompt action when necessary. Therapy can be performed through peripheral or central venous access. The system is portable with a small 35 milliliter extracorporeal volume that meets patient needs in a multitude of clinical settings. And it includes a customizable hematocrit monitor that can be tailored to individual patient needs. The hematocrit sensor provides real-time measurements of percent blood volume change. SVO2 monitoring provides insights into tissue oxygen delivery and a filter alert prompts action to extend filter life and reduce therapy time. Here you'll find an animation of the Aquadex system blood circuit. First, blood is withdrawn from the patient by the withdrawal line. It's pushed through the filter by means of the blood pump shown on the left, and then the blood returns to the patient by the infusion line. On the right, you'll see the ultrafiltrate pump has started to withdraw fluid from the filter and collects it in a UF bag. Zooming in on the filter itself, you'll see that water molecules and electrolytes are able to freely pass through the pores of the filter, but proteins like albumin are maintained within the bloodstream and returned to the patient. Because electrolytes are extracted from the filter in direct proportion to the water molecules, you'll find that the concentration of electrolytes in the blood is unchanged. The Aquadex Smart Flow system is comprised of three components, the Aquadex Smart Flow console, a venous catheter, and the blood circuit set. Ultrafiltration with the Aquadex device has been the subject of many clinical studies, including four randomized clinical trials, the highest level of evidence. These studies looked at various patient populations, including traditional congestive heart failure and patients with cardiorenal syndrome, and looked at various protocols for when to initiate and how to initiate ultrafiltration therapy. Generally, we've seen a positive impact on heart failure rehospitalizations and greater weight loss and fluid loss compared with IV diuretics. Patient selection considerations for ultrafiltration include the following. Fluid overloaded patients with low diuresis or natriuresis on standard therapy, which includes fluid greater than 10 pounds over dry weight or greater than 5 pounds for patients weighing less than 50 kilograms, low urine volume on standard therapy, for example, less than 100 cc's per hour, elevated serum creatinine or increasing serum creatinine on standard therapy, or unresponsiveness to diuretic therapy leading to persistent signs and symptoms of congestion. Patient history may include frequent hospitalizations due to fluid overload or rehospitalization due to fluid overload. Aquadex therapy requires the use of a venous access catheter. The following are some recommendations. A minimum of 14 or 16 gauge lumen size. For central venous catheters, this may include a dual lumen with two 14 gauge lumens, a dual lumen with two 16 gauge lumens, or a quad lumen, including at least one 14 gauge and one 16 gauge lumen. Or the dual lumen extended length catheter, otherwise known as the DELC, with a coil for peripheral access. 
What's not recommended are catheters with lumen sizes smaller than 16 gauge. These are too small and will not provide the sufficient blood flow. Pick lines, which are too small, long, and soft and may collapse when blood is withdrawn. Or peripheral IVs, which are too small and do not provide sufficient blood flow. When utilizing the Aquadex device, anticoagulation is recommended to prolong the life of the filter. Heparin is the most commonly used therapy, although other anticoagulation agents may be used if heparin is contraindicated, such as ergotraban. Anticoagulation is often administered at least 30 minutes prior to beginning therapy. Below are some example therapeutic ranges. For details, please refer to your standing order. There may be certain circumstances where patients may not be candidates for systemic anticoagulation, including recent surgery, such as cardiothoracic surgery. In this case, the use of heparin for anticoagulation should be restarted once homeostasis has been achieved, for example, post-op day two or three. This should be evaluated on an individual patient basis. Patients may have pre-existing disease, comorbidities, or contraindications, elevated liver function tests, morbid obesity, or patients being treated with oral anticoagulants. In cases where traditional anticoagulation recommendations are inappropriate, there are some alternative strategies currently being used, which include non-weight-based heparin, for example, 300 to 600 units per hour, pre-filter, in other words, using the withdrawal access port, ECMO heparin protocols, which include a narrower range of PTT, for example, 40 to 60, using heparinized saline to prime or reprime the circuit, or a bolus of heparin prior to initiation of therapy. There are non-weight-based options or weight-based options. Alternative administration sites for heparin, pre-filter administration via the withdrawal access port, may be used, particularly in cardiothoracic surgery, for low doses. This is because in the case where you use the withdrawal access port, the heparin is going to the filter before it's administered to the patient. Citrate is not recommended due to its molecular size. The blood flow rate setting on the Aquadex device controls the speed at which the blood moves through the circuit. The range is 10 to 40 milliliters per minute. Note that setting the blood flow rate below 20 milliliters per minute is not recommended as it may reduce filter life. If frequent occlusion alerts are experienced or pressures are trending to the outer limits, consider decreasing the flow rate. Having the patient's arm extended at the elbow and slightly abducted may maximize blood flow. Steady and reliable blood flow is critical to achieve a successful therapy outcome. UF rate limitations based on the blood flow can be found in the appendix of the user manual. During ultrafiltration, fluid is withdrawn from the intravascular compartment and refilled from the overhydrated interstitium. When the UF rate is the same as the plasma refill rate, blood volume stability is preserved, the UF rate being the rate of fluid removed from the intravascular space, and the plasma refill rate being the rate of fluid transported from the interstitial space to the intravascular space. The plasma refill rate generally declines during ultrafiltration with the reduction of extracellular fluid in the interstitial space. So in order to prevent hypovolemia, the UF rate should not exceed the plasmal refill rate, and it should be either maintained or reduced throughout therapy. The following two acronyms may be used as considerations for when to start therapy and when to stop therapy. FLUID stands for Frequent Admits for Volume Overload or Heart Failure, LABS meaning increasing serum creatinine, a patient being unresponsive to diuretics, inadequate urine output, or a patient being 10 pounds over dry weight. STOP stands for serum creatinine continuing to rise despite reducing the UF rate, therapy goal achieved, oliguria despite reducing the UF rate, or pressure meaning the patient is not tolerating therapy and has hypotension. Be sure to always refer to your institution's standing orders in order to determine the therapy delivery strategy. The fluid removal goals, 
the initial UF rate and criteria for rate adjustment, venous access site and catheter selection, anticoagulation protocol, and an option for hematocrit should all be included in the standard order. The next few slides include recommendations for fluid removal with ultrafiltration based on clinical research. At therapy initiation, the recommended blood flow rate is 20 to 40 milliliters per minute. The ultrafiltrate rate has a range of 0 to 500 milliliters per hour and should not exceed the plasma refill rate. The initial UF rate may be set based on systolic blood pressure, as seen in the table here. That rate can be decreased by 50 cc's per hour if any of the following are present. RV dysfunction greater than LV dysfunction, serum creatinine increase of 0.3 above baseline, or a baseline serum creatinine above 2.0, or a history of instability with diuresis or ultrafiltration. The UF rate should be titrated throughout therapy. Every six hours, evaluate the patient's blood pressure, heart rate, urine output, net intake and output, and serum creatinine. Consider decreasing the UF rate by 50 if any of the following are observed. A rise in serum creatinine above 15% or 0.2 compared to prior measurement. A drop in urine output of 50% or more compared to the prior six hours but still greater than 125 cc's in a six hour period. Resting systolic blood pressure decrease over 10 millimeters mercury compared to the prior six hours, but still above 80, or a resting heart rate increase above 20 beats per minute compared to the prior six hours, but still below 120. Consider holding the UF rate, or in other words, setting the UF rate to zero if any of the following are observed. Serum creatinine rise over 30%, or 0.4 compared to prior measurement. Urine output below 125 cc's in 6 hours. Resting systolic blood pressure decrease by greater than 20 millimeters mercury compared to the prior 6 hours, or any time systolic blood pressure is less than 80. A resting heart rate increase over 20 beats per minute compared to the prior 6 hours, or any time it's above 120. If the UA freight is held or set to zero, reevaluate after laboratory values are available. If hemodynamics are stable and serum creatinine has plateaued, consider restarting the UF rate at a rate that's 50 to 100 cc's per hour less than the previous rate. If the problem is persistent, volume overload present, then consider IV inotropes in patients with an ejection fraction less than 40% or RV systolic dysfunction or weaning vasodilators, especially in patients with HEFPEF or a right heart cath. The following are some considerations on when to discontinue therapy. One, the patient has reached a best achievable dry weight. This may mean evidence of poor tolerance of fluid removal and the UF rate is set below 100 cc's per hour or produces a net negative of less than one liter in a 24 hour time period. Two, resolution of congestion, meaning all of the following, JVP less than eight, no orthopnea, and trace or no peripheral edema. Three, persistent elevation in serum creatinine above 1.0 above baseline at the start of IV diuretic treatment. Or four, persistent hemodynamic instability. After the completion of UF therapy, if a satisfactory dry weight has been achieved and the serum creatinine is stable, initiate oral loop diuretic therapy with the goal to keep the patient net even and consider guideline-directed medical therapy. If the serum creatinine, hemodynamics, or urine output are not stable, hold diuretics until serum creatinine is stable for a minimum of 12 hours. If the elevated serum creatinine or hemodynamic instability is present, then consider a bolus of IV fluid. To turn on the console, press the on-off button. Follow the screen prompts. Press accept to sound speaker. Press accept if speaker sound is heard.
you arrive at the home screen. To load a circuit, press Prime. Press Accept to enter Prime mode or press Help for circuit loading instructions. Press Help to load the circuit. Attach the front cartridge, push until it clicks, rotate the pump clockwise until the console beeps. Attach the side cartridge, push until it clicks, rotate the pump clockwise until the console beeps. Insert withdraw front pressure sensor. Insert data key until it clicks. Insert side ultrafiltrate black banded pressure sensor. Insert side infusion white pressure sensor. Insert tubing into the blood leak detector, then stretch tubing. Stretch tubing in detector. Press accept when complete. Insert tubing into the air detector. Press accept when complete. Please place the hematocrit sensor clip on the dock located near the base of the console at the rear. Attach the ultrafiltrate bag to the weight scale hook. <laughs> Ensure the bag drain is closed by rotating clockwise. Press accept when complete. Attach the blue withdrawal line to the priming bag using spike, then hang.
Press accept when complete. Attach clear infusion line to the ultra filtrate bag and ensure all clamps are open. Press accept when complete. You will return to the original Prime screen. Press Accept to enter Prime mode. Clamp Infusion Line. Release infusion line clamp. Prime access ports. Use a 10 ml syringe. Connect to the withdraw access port. Remove 5 mls of saline. Clamp and disconnect. Remove air, connect to the infusion access port, infuse 3 mLs, clamp and disconnect. Once access ports are primed, press accept when complete. Empty ultrafiltrate bag. Close drain. Press accept or clear to continue. When making patient connections, clamp saline line circuit, clamp circuit line, disconnect, use a dead end cap or sight scrub for your saline spike. Leave to hang. Connect to patient. Repeat the step for the infusion line. To program a treatment, press the blood flow button. Increase to desired blood flow rate. Titrations by 5 mLs. Press accept. To program ultrafiltrate rate as prescribed by your physician, press the UFR button. Increase to desired rate.
Press accept when complete. If using hematocrit, press the hematocrit button to increase your hematocrit limit to prescribed rate. Press accept. All values have been entered. Make patient connections. Once patient connections are made, ensure all clamps are open at the catheter and both circuit lines. Press run. Blood pump should begin to spin until reaching programmed blood flow rate. Ensure ultrafiltrate pump is moving. When enabling hematocrit, a baseline must be achieved. Switches to baselining. Highlight hematocrit menu to see time elapsed. When troubleshooting, alarms may occur. Indicates withdrawal difficulty, adjusting flow. Withdrawal line occlusion, silence, Interventions listed on the screen. Use down arrow to see all interventions. Alarm will clear after occlusion is remedied. Air detect may occur. Press silence. Read interventions on the screen. Clear the alarm, press and hold manual to move air bubble to filter. Then resume therapy. Press silence. For infusion line disconnect, 
read interventions. For infusion line intervention, double clamp blue and white lines together. Press run. Count to 10. Open circuit clamps together. Therapy should resume. To adjust settings, press menu. Use the down arrow to highlight settings. Press accept. Any setting with default requires a change, power cycle on off, then resume therapy for new setting to take effect. To obtain history or measurements, Press menu, select reports and history, press accept, alarms and events, press accept, all events listed, clear to return to the menu. Select measurements, press accept, circuit time in 20 minute increments, blood flow rate averages, ultrafiltrate rate programmed, fluid removed over last 20 minutes, pressures listed for last 20 minutes. When hematocrit baseline is reached, it will be displayed at the bottom of the hematocrit box. To adjust hematocrit limit, press hematocrit. Adjust to prescribed volume increase. Press accept, new limit will be displayed. To monitor hematocrit, press the down arrow to highlight. Graph will be displayed. Limit is the dotted line. SVO2, always displayed next to hematocrit while hematocrit is enabled. To monitor the patency of the circuit during therapy, utilize the filter resistance menu listed at the bottom of the treatment status bar. Press the down arrow five times to highlight filter. Graph will be displayed. Ideal graph trend is below 1.0. To rebaseline hematocrit, press menu. 
Select number three, hematocrit rebase line. Press accept. New hematocrit baseline displayed. Press accept. New hematocrit baseline will be displayed. To reprime clamp circuit line on the withdraw blue line. Disconnect from the patient. Please flush, clamp, and cap your patient. Return to the saline clamp of the withdrawal circuit. Connect. Open saline clamp. Open circuit line clamp. When repriming and returning patient's blood volume, use the manual mode. Blue circuit line is connected to saline bag. Infusion white line is connected to the patient. Press and hold manual until the patient's blood volume is returned or about one minute. Once blood is returned, disconnect infusion line from patient. Flush, clamp, and cap your patient. Then connect circuit line to the ultrafiltrate bag. Attach clear infusion line back to the ultrafiltrate bag. Open clamps, empty any ultrafiltrate out from the UF bag. Record and document output as needed. Thank you for listening to this presentation. For more information, please visit our website and social media channels.